The following podcast is run by a couple of former wheel turners and one pit guy. It's uh, meant for entertainment, not uh, not so much information, but sometimes there's some good information. Um, the opinions expressed are just, these are the morons on the show. Not necessarily right, not necessarily wrong, not uh, the views of any of the sponsors or anything like that. So uh, these guys, they're going to be talking, they might swear here and there, so if that offends you, uh, either uh, grow up or... Uh, Give a little permission for mom and dad. All right, race fans, Ryan Aho here, the one and only Bert Lehman and Coach Krause in the house wearing some one to go show garb. How are you guys doing this week? Doing good. Uh, Sunday, we got 12 inches of snow here and Today it's gone already. <laughs> I, was, I was up north. I, I stayed up in Superior this weekend because uh, my boy Crash was his 85th birthday party, and they got over a foot of snow. I literally got 20 miles south of there when I left, and it was all gone. So I mean, it uh, yeah, it rained like crazy, and yep. I didn't I didn't have to drive in any of that stuff, so that was good. Coach Krause, how you doing? Well, uh, not here. The snow is still here, about a foot on the ground, and we haven't barely lost any. It was uh, about 18 degrees today, and boy, was that wind blowing. The roads are awful, so um, typical. We're used to it, right? Um, but I think that's going to put a halt to some things, set some things back here in Minnesota, that's for sure. But uh, like I said, just enjoying some time in the house and uh, relaxing. Well, we're technically only what, like uh... – Two weeks, right? It's supposed not this coming weekend, but the following weekend, we're supposed to have some racetracks open up in uh, the Minnesota, Wisconsin area. We'll see, right? I mean, the one thing I'll say is there was really no frost. So, I mean, it got cold. The snow was there. As soon as it warms up, rains a little bit, it'll all disappear. Um, so, I think it'll dry out faster because of no frost. But I guess uh, time will tell. So, we can't really complain because of the winter we had, but <laughs> man, I tell you what, I, I rather would have had it a little bit earlier so we can get racing under the underway, but I guess, uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see what happens. So episode number 217 guys, um, brought to you by impact health sharing, got a little cough, got a little allergies going on. It's crazy. Snow on the ground, cold out allergies. My eyes are itchy. It's just absolutely bonkers. Right. But Impact health sharing, right? You go to the pharmacy, maybe get yourself some prescriptions at a better deal. Uh, if you're in the market, right? If you're looking for health care, if you're looking for health insurance, if you're paying too much, hit me up, 218-969-1380. Pretty sure I can maybe help you save some money. Um, great deductibles, great pricing. You can go to any doctor. Uh, it's been a really good thing. So, Let's start with this, guys. Top five moments of the week. Um, had some pretty good ones, some interesting, not a ton of racing. I got to be honest. I'm I'm super excited, right, to get back to Wasota Racing so we can talk about our Wasota tracks, our Wasota guys. And, uh, I mean, nothing against the national scene, but it's just a lot more fun for me to talk about the guys that, that we know a lot better. But... Little shout out here, Brad Parson. Brad Parson's soil and egg solution. In fact, Kraus, uh, have you talked to Brad? Brad's gonna go modified racing. Brad's gonna run a mod this year instead of a late model. So pretty sure maybe you'll see him over at the Viking Speedway a little bit. Uh get him over there. But farmers, I know you might have some snow right now. It's gonna melt. Planting season right around the corner. If you're looking for higher yields, you want to make more money. Why not do a little testing? Why not give Brad a call, 320-219-3542, and find out about the products that he has that you can mix right with your current spray packages. And uh, he's got the data. He's got the number. Really good results. So let's see if Brad Parson can help you out. So, Bert, let's start with number five, little national late model scene here. Yeah, Earl Pearson Jr. has announced that he will not be following the Lucas Oil Tour. And, uh, I mean, he's followed this tour since it started. And uh, he was a champion for 
the first several years. I, I can't remember how many, but so, um, you know, before the season started, we wondered if he would have a ride and well, he kind of had a ride, I guess. And, you know, he said that, uh, his post on Facebook stated that, uh, they will be racing, but they'll, they're going to sit down and figure out, you know, what race is a hit. And, um, you know, he said this will allow him for the first time in a long time to spend more time with his family. So, um, you know, I, I'm sure he's, he wants to race, but you know, it's also good to spend time with the family. Yeah, it is. And all good things come to an, come to an end, right? He's been doing it for a long time at a high level. Not quite been the same EPJ <clears throat> over the last couple of years. When he got into that Papage ride a couple of years ago, he kind of had a little bit of a spark there, but never really carried it over to, to what we we're used to seeing. So congrats to him. So Earl Pearson Jr. Um, officially off the Lucas Oil Tour for the first time in 20 years. So pretty crazy. Um, little with soda news at number four. Kraus, what, what are you hearing? Yeah, um, it's heard that uh, Denon East um, had to re resign. Um, basically due to health issues, I actually, um, I, I was going to do it, got to know Denny here a little bit over the last couple of weeks, been working on some radio stuff with him and, and, um, I actually just sent him a text today, actually wished him well and, and hope all things are well. He's had, had knee surgery and had some complications and, um, got a bad infection and sounds like he's going to be laid up for six to eight weeks and, and, uh, just can't perform his job. So decided to resign. So, uh, Danny had a lot of really good things going this year. He really did. Um, him and Mike Jordet took that sponsorship rollover, um, and had some, had some stuff going on, some cool stuff going on. So I, he's definitely going to be missed. And, um, from the sounds of it, it looks like they appointed Tim Carlson from Grand Rapids, um, he's, um, he was on the board a few years ago and then they get back on and re-ran, didn't get on, but now they appointed him again. So, uh, so turn over there on the Wasota board. Hopefully they can get everything figured out. Cause like I said, they had, they had some good things going so far and, um, he's going to be a big loss. There's no doubt about it. He's pretty well connected and, and, uh, wanted to do what was best for the association for Wasota. And, um, he was big on that Hoosier contract too. So that may be a little, um, throw a little little change in that scenario too so obviously we wish the best for denny and uh, you got to take care of your health you know that ryan and and then bert and we have to take our health and make sure that we can be able to perform to our best so best wishes to denny and and hopefully the wasota board can um, keep up and running and keep things going yeah best wishes to denny there for sure i i had an opportunity to talk to him a little bit as well and it's kind of a bulldog when it comes to the tire deal he was not happy uh kind of looking like the tire cost going to go up. No official numbers as of yet, but um, he was kind of somebody that was at least trying to hold Hoosier accountable and trying to keep them a little bit more honest uh, on, on their tire prices. But uh, best wishes to him, and I'm sure, uh, I'm sure once he gets back rolling, we'll see him back around the racetrack. Number three, let's go World of Outlaws. Uh, sprint car action. So this past weekend down at Cannondale, a guy that's been slumping, Carson Macedo, so he, he's kind of got off to a really slow start, but as of late, kind of picking up the pace, his first win of the year, kind of, uh, Kraus, what do you think? We were texting there back and forth. What do you think? Two more laps? Do you think David Gravel was going to drive right on by him, or do you think it would have even taken that long? I think it would have been turns one and two. He would have got alongside of him, and then who knows going down into, into three and four. But um, whatever Gravel did on that red flag, because um, they have working reds, um, tire bleeders, air pressures, you know, they can do stuff with like, like that. Um, so it was super interesting to see, he must've done something because he took off after that, that red flag. And I mean, he was coming another lap or two. I think he would have got him, but uh, Hey, he ran out of time. But overall, I thought after that red, it was, it was a little bit better race guys had some time to make some adjustments, but, uh, I think one more corner, I think he was a sitting duck. Yeah. We well, might've had a photo finish there, but Bert, what do you have on that? Well, and earlier in the race, it was almost disaster for Macedo. He got caught up behind a, a slower car and actually jumped the, the rear tire of the slower car. And both his front tires were up off the ground, but he was able to get him back down and keep going. Yeah, when luck is on your side, right? Kind of Giovanni Selzy had that a, a couple weeks ago when he climbed the fence and kept on going. And Macedo parking it in victory lane, his first win of the 2024 season guys let me ask you this um of course a couple of the big dogs not really racing world of outlaws right they're doing the high limit 
Um, we have uh, Brad Sweet, you know, he's multi-time champ. Um, Rico ran a bunch of woo stuff last year. Over or under? Do you think that Carson Macedo will be over or under? I'm going to set the number at seven wins on the 2024 season. You think he's going to go over or under that? I'll say over. Cross. Oh, boy, I'm going under. You're going to go under? All right, so there you go. Bird's going to say over seven. Kraus is saying under seven. We'll see what we can figure out here before the end of the year. I think he's going to hit seven um, before the end of August. I think he's going to get rolling here and start clicking off some wins. Number two, let's go uh, Let's go late model action. And, and crazy as it is, right, no real dramatic stuff. Racing was kind of ho-hum. Guy that's been really hot over the last couple of years at Speed Weeks and then just kind of just a guy, right, kind of the rest of the season, just a guy, Devin Moran. But I tell you what, he's kind of clicking. He had a first and a third here this weekend. Let me ask you this. Has he taken that next step? Can you see Devin Moran becoming maybe that guy, you know, last year, RTJ, Bobby Pierce, before that, Davenport, then Overton, then Huddy. Do you think, um, or not Huddy, but uh, Sheppy before that, do you think it's Devin Moran's year in 2024? Uh, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, like you said, you know, uh, he's gotten off the fast starts in previous years. Granted, that was mainly in speed weeks, where now he's carried it a little past speed weeks. Uh, uh, but it's a little bit early in the season to say it's going to be his year where he's going to be the dominant driver. Isn't it almost every Lucas race there's been a different winner? I mean, there hasn't been a whole lot of uh, multiple-time winners in the Lucas this year, so uh, maybe it's just... Just a lot of parody this year. Yeah, there was six different winners. Carl's predicted that. Six different winners in six nights at East Bay. Devin Moran, one of the few guys with multiple wins on the season. He's off to a, a really good start. And I I don't know. I don't know if he's going to quite have that year that RTJ and Pierce had last year. But keep an eye on Devin Moran. He's a guy that could literally click off some wins. He's looked really strong to start the season. Now let's go to the top story of the week. And this one here, guys. Kind of a touchy subject for a lot of people, right? Chassis builders, drivers. Before we get into that, speaking of chassis builders, Fast Lane Motorsports and Powder Coating up in Ashland, Wisconsin. So they build the Galloper chassis, but they do a lot more. They sell tires. They sell safety equipment. They service a lot of racetracks, custom powder coating, fabricating, number one sponsor of the best series in all of uh, Wasota Racing, the Northland Superstock Series. Check them out, Fastlane Motorsports and Powder Coating up in Ashland. So the top story of the week in dirt track racing, and, and this is kind of behind the scenes, right? A, not a national stage. It was an IMCA race down at the Arrowhead Speedway in Colcord, Oklahoma. IMCA stock car action. Um, Hachu in the IMCA stock car is kind of one of the young guns. Ran really good at Bristol here um, a couple years ago when they had the, the stock cars down there. Dallin Murdy, guys, he went for a he went for a tumble, and I watched the video, and and it was a pretty good uh, roll. He climbed the fence, kind of got upside down, and a car hit him in the rough. Worst case scenario, right? I mean, literally, when you get upside down, the the scariest two things that are the scariest is a getting hit in the roof and b fire. Right? Fortunately, there was no fire, but guys, that roll cage crumbled. I mean, I saw pictures of that deal, and I tell you what, God was looking out for him because he walked away, no injuries, and when I looked at the pictures of that, I'm like, how did he survive? I mean, it was it was crazy. I don't think I've seen a car come apart that bad ever. I mean, Bert, did you see those pictures? Yeah, I saw the pictures. Uh, I mean, you guys know roll cage was better than I do, and I didn't. I didn't know if they had to use the jaws of life to cut them out of the, out of there. So I didn't know if uh, bars were cut, you know, with the jaws of life. Uh, you know, I don't know if that was used, but uh, they did. But yeah, they did. They they okay. had to cut some bars out of there. They did. Okay. Yes. And uh, but then I saw some pictures. I don't know if you saw these. There were some pictures on Facebook of the car from the next day where they they showed pictures and 
yeah, I mean, uh, the chassis just completely moved over, uh, you know, in the roll, roll cage area. So, yeah, he's very lucky to, you know, walk away from that without any injuries. Kraus, let me ask you this. When you saw that roll cage, right, when I saw it, I, I was kind of mad, right? I looked at that, I'm like, what in the hell? I mean, it, and it's a rep. I'm not going to mention the chassis builder on here. You can look that up online. It's a reputable place. They build good race cars and a lot of lot of crashes, you know, and they've been doing it for a long time. Um, your thoughts on the construction? Should a, should a roll cage do what that roll cage did? <clears throat> Boy, I, I mean that's a that's a tough one, Ryan. Because uh, you remember you remember the Ryan Newman incident a few years ago in NASCAR. Okay, he got hit by a car. He didn't he didn't hit the track. He didn't hit the wall. And I don't I don't know what the concrete did to that rollover. I've tried to watch the video and see if he landed on the concrete beforehand or if it weakened it or who knows what. Um, but obviously, uh, he got hit by a car uh, upside down. So. Um, you know, it, I, I think it's just one of those unfortunate things where now we got to take a look at safety again um, on the driver's side of things. Um, you know, and hopefully they can measure some tubing and make sure, you know, all that stuff was, you know, legal. And um, do we got to go into, you know, first thing I did, Ryan, I went and I went and looked for uh, one of the, uh, you know, the steel tube readers. He, um, I went on Amazon because I'm, I'm, we're going to buy one for Viking Speedway. There's no doubt about it. And I'm going to check all the cars. I, I just, I, I think as a, as a track, as a promoter, I think we have to do that. Cause a lot of times you buy these cars, you don't know, you, you're going to put your trust into the chassis builders that they're doing things right. Um, so I think that's something I, to be honest with you, I think Wasota should hop on board and help tracks with these things. You can get a nice one for four or 500 bucks and just check them. You need to check these things and know beforehand. Cause like I said, we're at Viking Speedway. Our speeds at Viking Speedway are way faster than any other track. Um, fortunately we don't have concrete in the corners. We just have some on the front straightaway. Um, so, uh, I, I was looking at pictures and trying to see what he can do. I mean, he had the, he had the really nice seat. Um, but the way some of those bars bent and ripped and crushed, uh, something definitely needs to be looked there. So hopefully they can R and D that car. Um, and IMCA or I, well, I don't know if what if it was a USRA race, I think maybe, um, but at least they can look at those and say, and, and hopefully the chassis builder can look at it and say, Hey, what can we do better? Um, you know, what we can do for support. Cause you have to, when at the racetrack, you have to think worst case scenario. And that was definitely a worst case scenario. You never know what can happen. So, so it was interesting to see. And first thing for me now is I look at cages and, you know, what can I do as a track, as a promoter, or, you know, with Wasota, you know, to help our drivers to keep them safe. You know, and it, it was a fluky deal, right? I mean, let's face it. It was a fluke. I mean, he got hit in the roof. It didn't look like it was hard, but it doesn't take much. Bert, you had a comment. I'll let you kind of jump. Well, on. I was just going to say, I mean, it. I think it could have been worse, but he rolled enough distance ahead of the car coming into the corner where where at least on the video it looked like the car coming into the corner was able to slow down a little bit at least and going into the corner you're kind of slowing down a little i mean you're still going fast uh but you're slowing down but you know like if he would have been at the end of the straightaway rather than in the corner and you know a car would have hit him full steam it could have been worse i mean it was still bad but i think i think he could have got hit worse or harder you know but i think the car had coming into the corner slowed down a little bit because he saw what was happening yeah absolutely and you know a couple things there so um according to what they posted themselves the family the murdy family posted they crashed this car a couple years ago and then they repaired the roll cage yeah. themselves okay so i don't know how much of the roll cage they repaired themselves or exactly what they did there but I tell you what, man, I, I, you know, there's a, every, every backwoods person out there, me included, it's like, oh man, I got a pipe bender and a welder. I'm a chassis builder now, right? You can you just do whatever you want. Well, I tell you what, all it takes is one time, you know, all it takes is one time and life is over. And, you know, one of the things you mentioned, Krause, about getting the, the reader to measure the thickness. Well, the problem with that is, in Wasota, anyway, you can run pretty thin wall tubing. I th I think it's as much as like 065 
for a freaking uh, chrome molly tubing. Well, in my opinion, that shouldn't even be allowed. Just get rid of the chrome molly crap, first of all. Not, not that it's bad tubing or whatever, but if you're going to have chrome molly, you have to know how to weld that. I'm not, and I'm not saying that has anything to do with this car. I don't know what they had for tubing or, or thickness, but I think that all chassis builders, all sanctions should go to 095 minimum on main cages. I mean, minimum and, and maybe even thicker. Guys, I mean, Krauss, how much lead do you have bolted onto your super stock? Uh, two, three hundred pounds. Minimum, right? Minimum. There's cars out there, right, that have 400 plus pounds of lead bolted to their cars. You're telling me that these chassis builders can't build the roll cages out of thicker tubing? I mean, what are we talking about here, right? We don't need to have that much lead bolted onto these race cars. Make the cages better, right? And fortunately, he was okay, but my God, I mean, you start looking at some of the stuff that's built, home-built stuff, and and you look at the thickness, and uh, the chassis builder came on there, and he says, hey, as per the rules, the car's legal. And it was. Car's legal. But me and Carlos have been to some of these rules meetings. We've seen some of the people making rules. I'm not putting my life in them people's hands. I can tell you that much for free, right? There's some people making rules that in no way, shape, or form know absolutely anything about anything. So just because it's legal doesn't mean that safety can't be improved. And and this is an instant here where fortunately it wasn't a, a life, you know, a life wasn't taken. But I I really hope the cha- uh, sanctioning bodies across the country look at this situation and they're like, you know what, maybe we need to look closer at safety and cross. Maybe you can spearhead that, you know, take some pictures, send them over to the tech committee, being that you're a track promoter and say, look, should we be looking closer at these roll cages? Bert, it looks like you had something. Uh, well, I was just going to say that the chastity builder also said that uh, the cage did its job. Um, so, I mean, you can, <laughs> I mean, I guess, I guess, you know, there were no injuries and everything. So I guess you could say the cage did its job, but. Um, if Jeff Cross or Don Ashens is driving that car who are taller than Dal and Murdy, they're dead. Yeah. I mean, you're dead. Your neck is broken. You're dead uh-huh. for sure. You know, so Dal and Murdy ain't a very big kid. You get a big dude in one of these cars and that cage collapses like that one did, you know, and another problem, and I don't know what the Wissota rules are, but IMCA's roll cages are, are stupid. You got to have, it's got to be like the full width of the, of the car, the roll cage. It can't be the narrow roll cage. So there's a big void in between there where there's like no support. There's no, there's nothing there. So just because it's got a wide cage in their mind, they're like, oh, it's got to be safer. It's a bigger roll cage. Well, the whole middle of it collapsed, right? So sometimes that narrower cage is better. So I don't know. There's a lot of things that can be looked at there, and, and hopefully some people take that seriously. So Dallin Murdy, fortunately, okay, but um, jump online. It's all over Facebook. You can kind of see the incident there. So this past week's events, let's do a little rapid fire here. There was a little bit of racing action. Um, but first, a shout-out, speaking of chassis builders here, we've got uh, a little prototype coming up. But we're, uh, He's got pictures up there. We'll let him talk about that. But who do you want to shout-out here, Carlos? Ah, flat out performance and turbine chassis. Um, special thanks to them for sponsoring the show. Um, make sure if you need any needs, get a hold of uh, Jeff and the boys over there at um, Flat Out Performance and Turbine Chassis. Um, another guy that I know, um, he's going to build it safe. I know that uh, he's been he's a racer. Um, he's going to do things the right way over there. So uh, make sure you hop online. He's got a Facebook page, um, Flat Out Performance and Turbine Chassis in Hancock, Minnesota. Absolutely. Thanks a lot, guys. So I'm going to name off a couple particular races here, and uh, you guys can just Anything that comes to mind, right? So Lucas Oil Late Models at Brownstown. Bert. Um if you're if you're going slow and won't get out of the way, I'm gonna push you out of the way. <laughs> <laughs> that you stole it right from me. So what <laughs> he's talking about there, guys, is so Devin Moran's leading. And he's navigating lap traffic. Bobby Pierce, car looked a little tight, not quite getting through lap traffic as good as the 99. And flat out 
dumped a lap car. Bert, in your opinion, was that like a racing deal or did he just look at it and go, you know what? If I spin this guy out, we're going to restack him. I have another shot at the lead. Was that on purpose? Well, I think it was on purpose. I think it was a case where Moran was running the high side and got around Pierce and Pierce saw him getting by and knew that there was going to be that lapper in between them. So yeah, he just flat out spun him and knew that he was going to get a spot back. <laughs> Kraus, is that a dick move or a smart move by the 32? Just racing hard, Bert. Come on. I mean, <laughs> like our boy, um, uh, man bun Dan says, um, <laughs> so I had to throw it in there. If you're not part of the race, get out of the race. Right. So, uh, I mean, that's the point. He just got past you. I mean, he took advantage of the no-fault rule, I and mean, it is what it is. You know, it's hard racing, but at the end of the day, he's just following the rules. It's no-fault rule. Oh, you, yeah. can lappers, you can punt lappers all you want, just as long as you yeah. keep going, and he didn't wreck nothing, yeah. didn't wreck anybody, and then it is what it is. You're chicken shit, Carlos. You're, you're too politically <laughs> correct here, all right? Literally, we're going to get freaking Man Mundan on the show because you're chicken shit. I'm going to ask you straight out. Okay, I want I want the truth. You're racing, you're you're Bobby Pierce. You're you're running cars a little tight, you're not getting through lap traffic, no fault caution. That lapper's in the way. Do you flat out knowing that you're gonna get your spot back? Do you just drive through that guy, take advantage and restack him? Or uh is it just kind of hard racing there? Well, a few years ago, I told you Jimmy Mars punted what's-his-face on purpose at Cedar Lake, and you're like, no, he'd never do that. He'd never do that. <laughs> so then we come up here with the Bobby Pierce thing. Well, of course he punted him, Ryan, just like Jimmy Mars <laughs> punted him. What, who, I can't remember who he punted. So I, yeah, he punted, yeah. That was, I, I text Ryan right away, and I said, Jimmy just punted him intentionally. Sure enough, he did. Um, and Jimmy admitted to it. I know you talked to him about that horrible deal. That was that's old news, right? Yeah, but no, yeah. Pierce definitely did, and um, clean, dirty. It was clean, dirty, though. You know what I mean? It, there, right. there's a difference between you know he, like I said, it, it was clean, dirty. He made it look like he was going to do it, and um, Lapper was in his way, and he drove in a little harder, drove the Lapper a little harder, and a little, little dirtier, and punted the guy. I think it's smart. I mean, it's a stupid rule, dumbest rule on planet Earth. I hate the rule, right? But if the rule's there. Use it to your advantage. Like you said, he didn't destroy him. He just flat out spun him around, brought out the yellow, restacked him, and he still didn't have enough for the 99. But, wow, that, that was an interesting dilemma. The Facebook was buzzing. They're like, he should go to the back. It's like, have you not watched Lucas Oil Racing? <laughs> Nobody goes to the back. It's the same thing, you know. But, uh, yeah, Mor Moran got her done. Anything else there, Bert, that stuck out from Brownstown? Uh, well, uh, how do you finish the head of uh, McCready, the Rocket One team? So that was interesting. Um, and uh, RTJ is just not RTJ of last year so far. He's struggling, struggling. Coach Krause, other than the uh, Bobby Pierce incident there and Moran parking it, parking it in Victory Lane, anything else stick out to you from Brownstown? Yeah, Bert, you're missing um... – how did Longhorn and the Rocket House Car do, Bert? They should they should um, go down to the local um, uh, construction um, place down there and get backup beepers because that's what the whole ho <laughs> house cars did. Um, yeah. They should put a, they should have put backup beepers on that thing. So that was my takeaway. I'll give McCready a pass, but even though he was he was fast, um, quick times up, won his heat, killed him in the heat, and um, just. They didn't. They're they're gonna have to do some adjusting. McCready's a little bit different driver than Huddy, but they'll get it figured out. Um, and then Shepard, basically, made, not, not straight backwards, but went backwards. So that was my takeaway. It was the two house cars that went straight backwards. Yeah, the other thing I have is Jimmy Owens, right, did not make the show at Brownstown. And he mentioned, you know, they mentioned on the broadcast, Jimmy Owens, you know, he's back. He's going to follow the Lucas Oil Tour, right? Guys, he didn't pay. So at the beginning of the year, you, I, I don't know what it's called, but it's kind of like a a fee at the beginning of the year that if you pay it and you kind of join, you you get provisionals. Well, I don't know, right? But if you're going to follow the series, you think you'd pay that deal so you can get the provisional because he didn't get a provisional, didn't make the show. He's essentially like, why follow the series? He already missed a feature. Is it is it kind of a waste of time for him to even consider 
following the Lucas Oil series now, being that he missed the feature at Brownstown? I mean, he definitely needs to take a close look at that because, yeah, I mean, obviously your goal in following a series is to try to finish in the top four to run for the championship. But, uh, um, you know, he'll have to take a look at it. And, um, you know, I don't know what other perks he gets for following the series. <laughs> what do you got there, Carlos? What do you got? Well, Bert, I mean, he's in eighth place. 230 points back. I mean, it's not the end of the world. Uh, there's And there's big-time money in the top 10 in Lucas Oil's deal. I mean, it's sure. big-time money, and he's, I mean, he's a hundred and he's only 100 points back of fifth of Marlar right now. So in Marlar's... How far out of fourth? How far out of fourth is he? Huddy's seven, what's 230 minus 75, so you're looking at about 160. So, I mean, it's not, it's not horrible. Um, and, and it's doable, and you know, you go on a month tear or month and a half tear and you're finishing good, throwing in some podiums and winning your top 10 all the time, you're going to be right there. So uh, interesting to see. And I, I just looked at the points and realized that, boy, that's not that's not horrible. And as soon as Moran gets caught cheating with tires again, he might move up a spot there. <laughs> so there's that. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> all right. So Lucas Oil at Atomic. Um. Kind of a ho hum race, not not too exciting. They spent a lot of time during the intermission dumping water on it, but I guess if you don't dig up the track at all, the water doesn't do a whole lot of good. <laughs> yeah, if you water Walmart parking lot, it's still rock hard, right? So there is that. And and Bert, you could have actually went with the exact same thing as the first one. If you're not in the race, get the hell out of the race because uh there was one guy that continuously just seems to ruin every <laughs> Uh -huh. Rouse, who who's that guy again? Boom shakalaka. Oh my <laughs> gosh! Boom Briggs, Kaz and Yellows, and it was just the first one was really bad because it was really getting interesting because all yeah. five of those guys were catching each other. Um, there would have been it was going to be a five car, and basically when it comes down to that, is whoever gets out front. You saw the next night, you know, with Moran and Pierce, you know, whoever basically was going to get out front, um, someone could have slipped by, you know, Davenport. Um, you know, who knows, but, uh, of course, boom breaks, he, maybe, I don't know. He, he's in a rocket car. Maybe, maybe they wanted McCready to catch up a little bit and they needed a yellow. That, that could be maybe a little strategy there, you know, and a couple guys, you know, we talked about Moran, right? He got a first and a third, but Mike Marlar has been strong, right? A couple podiums there again for the one five, seven. So, I tell you, there's a guy, he's on the outside looking in. Marlar's currently, pull that, actually, I might have it here. Marlar is in what? One, two, three, four, what was he in? Fifth place? 130 points back. Looks like he's about 55 points out of fourth. I tell you what, you know, how do you, I don't, we don't really know what his plans are, if he's going to do the Rumley deal. Marlar's kind of surging up. He could find himself creeping right into that conversation here. He's looking pretty good, and you know, the points right now, 20 RT, as bad as it's been, right, compared to last year, he has not been good. He's still leading points. He's still five points ahead of Superman. So um, RTJ is as off as he's been. He's still in good position. And uh, we did have a fan shoot us a question, said, you know, Pierce ran a couple. Is he going to follow the whole Lucas series? Well, he missed all the speed weeks, right? He was at New Zealand. He didn't run any of the Lucas stuff. So um, I would say that he is definitely not going to follow the Lucas Oil Series. He'll run some shows for sure, but he's not going to run every show. Anything else on the Lucas stuff, guys, before we jump into the sprint car race? No, not really. Yeah, Canada, we talked about that a little bit, right? Uh, Macedo parking in Victory Lane. Um, gravel in second. Anything else stick out to you guys at Kennedale for the World of Outlaw Sprint Cars? I only watched one of the features, and uh, uh, there was no, only one. There was only one. There, oh, there was only one. Oh, okay, yeah, one night rained out. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's why I couldn't <laughs> find the other one. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I, I can only find one. Yeah, there was only one there, guys. So you're, okay, you're, you're all on right. Pace. You're on pace. All right. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know who's been surprisingly kind of sneaky good 
is uh, the North Pole. I think a North Pole nightmare, they call him. Bill Baylog with another top mm-hmm. five finish. Guys, he's he's kind of on. I don't know where he's sitting in the points right now, but he's kind of in the mix there. I'm not saying he's going to race necessarily for a championship, but he won, I think, nine features last year. He kind of ran uh, the IRA Sprint Car Series, but he's going to follow the World of Outlaw Series this year. Keep an eye on him. Um, what's you guys' thoughts? Do you think Bill Baylog's the guy that can find victory lane here um, in the 2024 season with the World of Outlaw Sprint Cars? Um, I will say yes, and if if he does, it'll be at Beaver Dam Raceway. That's kind of, be pretty I, good there. Yeah, I mean, if you had to say he had a home home track, that would be his home track. Okay, okay. And right now, uh, the points are tied, right? Hot Sauce, Giovanni Selzy, David Gravel tied for the lead. There's a guy, though. There's a guy that is literally nipping on their heels. Donnie Schatz right now, only 16 points back to those guys. Okay, now Schatz, he hasn't been the, the winning races like he has, you know, in years past when he had his what 10 championships but nobody's really dominating Kraus could our local guy right could Donnie shots could this be his year to find himself back on top in the world of outlaw standings yeah absolutely I you know I think he um he's he's been a lot more consistent lately there's no doubt about that and I think he maybe wants to stick it to the high limit a little bit too I, I think I think that's uh something back of his mind too. And, and, uh, been, you know, another interesting fact, I'll throw my two cents in here. You know, you say Bill Baylog, um, you know, with these other guys jumping series, you, you're starting to see some of these other guys who usually are never up there, never in the top 10, top 20, they're getting a chance to race now and they're really showing their stuff. So it, it's actually good to see. And, um, my main takeaway from that, Ryan, from this last weekend is the car count. I mean, they went from twenty from 19 to 21 in Texas two weeks ago. They're up to, what are they, 42, 45 or yep. something crazy like that? So my big takeaway was the car count and the following. I, I thought, boy, I saw 40-some sprint cars. I was like, oh, boy, they're down in Texas. And, and the number about doubled from the week before. So some interesting stuff going on there. Well, they interviewed a few of them guys, and uh, I'm glad you brought that up because it's like, why was there so few cars at a Texas race? It didn't make any sense. Well, there was a big weather scare, and it was a big question mark if they were even going to get the races in a couple of weeks back. And uh, there, was a, there was a handful of drivers that said, you know what, with the weather looking bad, we're just not going. And all of a sudden, they're like, well, you know what, we are going to go. Wow, rain or shine, we're going to be there because we're not going to miss it. So uh, the weather, I think, played a factor, but good to see them back. And I think you're exactly right. Maybe some surprise winners coming in uh, the world of Outlaws. And uh, we had... Uh, not necessarily a Wasota race, right? But Super Stocks, right? You got me, you got Krause's Super Stock Show. It just is what it is. Sorry, Bert. It just is what it is. <laughs> well, Super Stock action across Mojave Valley Speedway, Bullhead City, Arizona. 1,000 to win for Super Stocks. Bodies of cars look like a Wasota Super Stock, but most of the guys down there had some pretty big thunder, aluminum heads, bigger engines than a Wasota car. But uh, we did have a guy, a uh, Wasota guy, go down there and run pretty darn well. Yeah, Bo Brown uh, coming away with another second-place finish. And I was actually all over the leader. The um, the track wasn't um, – it, was, it wasn't very good. I, we, I think um, I flipped it on. I can't remember. I texted you, and I, I flipped on Dirt Race Central. And um, I, there was about 15 to go. There was a couple of yellows, but it was right on the tires – um, maybe possibly in the infield a little bit because they were kicking up some stuff. But, um, um, you know, the leader did a good job holding his line, but you can you can hear those babies when they come by that front stretch. They got some motors in them things, and uh, they definitely do. But uh, Bo came home with a second-place finish, ran strong, car looked good, he looked solid, and uh, it was good to see. Uh, it's always good to watch some super stock action. You know, I'm going to say this, uh, soft. That's the word I'm going to go with. Bo, you're soft, man, soft. Okay, this this back in the day, we're talking back when I'm running super stocks against Kraus. Jeff Kraus, this is a thousand to win, right? You traveled that far to get down there, and you're getting to his rear bumper every single corner of the last what ten laps of that race. 
just how hard are you going to punt that guy on a bump and run to take the lead? He didn't even hit him. I mean, nice clean race there, Bo, but soft, man. Use the bumper. That's what it's there for. Right? Is that what you would have done, Cross? I know you would have. Yeah, I ain't got to ask you. I've raced against you. Gee, it would have been a strong possibility, but uh, <laughs> he's probably sitting there. I don't know what second place paid, but he's like, I at least might get a little bit of my gas money back anyway. Right, yeah. But his luck, he would have punted him and spun him all got put to the back. So probably a little smarter than my, than we might have been in that situation. So um, Huddy and T-Mac, kind of the story here this past weekend. Neither one of them parked in victory lane, but Huddy, uh, who looked better? Who looked better? So Huddy had the flat. He had the flat. So Huddy transition. He's running the Rumley car. He ran the Rumley car. T Mac, of course, and Rocket One in the two races that they had. I know small sample size. Which one of those two looked better, in your opinion? Well, I think without the flat tire, I think Huddy would have had better finishes in both races um when compared to T Mac. Um but you know for Huddy, you know, we don't know what his next ride is gonna be. Supposedly this Romley ride is only for this week. Why well, I, I guess Huddy is racing this weekend in the Southern Southern Nationals tour. Uh but other than that, you know, he doesn't have a ride. So you don't know what the rest of his season includes. But you're talking about uh you know, they'll have to make some adjustments for T-Mac. And that's one of the things I've read in different articles is that, you know, the, you know, B-Shep and Huddy, they like to get up on the cushion and, you know, run the high side where, you know, T-Mac doesn't necessarily do that anymore at this stage in his career. So, you know, do they, does T-Mac go back to, you know, when he was younger running the high side or does Rocket One make adjustments to suit uh, T-Mac's driving style? It's a good question. Time's going to tell. So let's jump on to some fan questions here, guys. Uh, this segment, of course, we'll just stick with make it easy. We'll call it fan questions, right? Brought to you by Hard Charger Race Engines, our friend Nick Hoff out in Sydney, Montana. Speaking of Montana, right? So Nick, uh, he built engines for me. I ran I ran a, a different, different name. It was Hard Charger Race Engines. Now it's Hard Charger performance specialties um because he does a lot more than engines he, he does gears he does a lot of stuff he's got a dyno in fact the only dyno where he can schedule time within like a 500 mile radius out there so if you want to tune it up get a hold of him for that but um had a lot of success i won races provenzino won races with his stuff been doing it for over 20 years he can build anything you want from street stocks to late models and everything in between also, if you have a if you're a Wasoda guy running a crate engine, and especially if you're out in that neck of the woods, if you need that crate engine fixed, you can't just do it yourself, right? With a if you have a, a bot engine, right, and not a crate, and you hurt something, you can fix it yourself if you want to. With a crate, you can't. You have to send it in. It has to be sealed. Well, he's the guy out there that can actually repair those. So he's the crate guy. So get a hold of Nick. He does a great job. Great guy. Known him for a long time. 406-478-4437. That's hard charger performance specialties. So Bert, uh, you have a few. We got we got a few questions here from for some fans, and um, I actually had you print them off there. Brent, uh, a good friend of the show, and sent us a list of questions here again. Why don't you read off? Uh, he's got a few of them there, and uh, we'll kind of give our little feedback there to Brent to start off with. Yeah, he has three questions. The first one is, a while back, Ogilvy had the had the Cowboy doing co-commentary during the racing, and he provided some unique insight, and it seems that most sporting contests try to involve former participants. Should local racetracks try to get a former driver, crew chief, into the booth to help out with track commentary on a regular basis. Kraus, you want to take that one? I, I got my feedback on that. I'll let you go ahead. Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's definitely a good idea. I know um, we try to do with our hockey broadcast too. try to get somebody with, with some knowledge. I, I think it's one of the reasons a lot of people listen to NASCAR or watch NASCAR, especially on TV with, when you got, whether it's Jeff Gordon or Kevin Harvick or Clint Boyer, I mean, you got guys that've been there and done that, past champions. Um, you know, I, I, as a racer, it's good to hear. I, you know, question is, does a normal fan 
really care that they might, but I think from a racing standpoint, I think it helps. And, and especially if you get the right guy up there too, uh, it's got to make sure he's got to have, you know, he's got to be enthused and it's got to be the right person who's, who's been there and done that and can relate and can joke and have some fun. Um, you're not just throwing some old, old hoot, coot up there and it's nothing's, nothing's really going on. So I, I think the more knowledge that these fans um, get I think it's a better you might get them to come back say yeah that was kind of cool I got to listen to this guy or um, hey let's go down in the pits and talk to some of these guys afterwards so I definitely think it's a good idea yeah I I totally agree and, and we'll get Bert's perspective here too because he's a fan we're the driver's perspective and you're the fan perspective and and I love it I think and, and co-announcing right a lot of times track have one announcer and and he's just kind of announcing he's reading off the sheet do a little play-by-play, but man, I tell you what, my preference is having two people up there that can kind of communicate back and forth, and one of them, maybe a driver, former crew guy, maybe a former track, you know, a track promoter, whatever it may be, but somebody that's kind of been in the grind because they have a a different way of looking at things than than just the announcer. Bert, your thoughts? Well, I agree with you. I think... uh, um it's a more entertaining program if there are two announcers. I mean, and if you have one who has raced in the past and can provide good insight, you know, that that's a bonus. Um, you know, a lot of times, I mean, uh, tracks have a difficult time finding one announcer. So (laughs) sometimes getting two announcers is, is wishful thinking, but, uh, you know, if you can get two announcers, that's a bonus. And the thing is with announcing, if you have somebody up there who has raced in the past, to me, if you are a fan at the track, when you need an announcer is when there's no racing action taking place on the track, because you can't hear the announcer while the races are going on for the most part, for most of the time. Anyway, a good announcer is able to, uh, make it seem like there is no downtime at the track. Boy, that's, that's very good too. And there's two sides of that, right? Cause there's at the track, which you're spot on, you know, when there's a lot of downtime and I've been to racetracks where there's no racing going on and there's like no talking, no nothing. And people are losing interest and their attention spans are really, really short. Or, or a racetrack where, where during the intermission or during downtime, they turn the radio on. <laughs> right right which is better than nothing but yeah it's still you know it, it, it's not it's not keeping people's attention but the online no no let's face it streaming racing has become a big deal so not only the but when they're streaming we can hear that wa- watching so right. having that play-by-play they may not hear that at the track but on the streaming platform they certainly can and it doesn't have to be the same guy it doesn't have to be like hey we're gonna have you know, Joe Racer come in and, and be there every week, mix it up, right? You know, um, get some people from, you know, from the past, you know, and I tell you what, as a, as a race fan, you know, if I go like to the Hibbing Raceway and I go, if I go there and all of a sudden there's a guy in the booth that used to, I used to watch race when I was a kid, that would be awesome. You know, Viking Speedway, you know, you get, you get old Larry Krause up there, you know, Scott Dan's East is kind of a mute. He's kind of a man, a few words, although he'd be, great insight i don't know if if he'd be the guy but man oh man i think that's a great idea and that's something tracks could definitely do to to enhance the program for sure um what's the next one there bert uh next question um says a question more for coach kraus and aho when you watch a race you were involved in on video does it change does it change your perspective from the in-car view after you guys finish answering it, I can actually answer this question too. All right. All right. So Coach Kraus, we'll start with you. Yeah, absolutely. It can. Um, video doesn't lie. Right, Ryan. Um, and you, and I've, it's one of the, and I know I used to watch video all the time, even the, I mean, now it's different, but back when I started racing, it was uh, Ma or Pa or the wife up in the stands with the video with the camcorder 
And then you're downloading stuff onto your TV and putting it on your computer and watching it. You know, now it's just I log on to DRC and type in Viking Speedway and hit play. Um, so it's a little bit easier. So I used to watch a lot of video, learned a lot. You learn a ton watching videos. I've had in-car cameras. I've had I've had it all. And you learn a bunch, and it definitely changed your perspective, especially in the incidents. And, you know, God, this, uh, you know, they made the call on me. Well, this guy chopped me. You know what I mean? Or vice versa. Oh, boy, I got in a little too hard, you know. So it's it definitely it definitely can change your um, change your tune a little bit. But at the end of the day, we're we're always right. Right, Ryan? One hundred percent. We are. There's no question. Now, here, here's my perspective on this. Actually, you know what, Bert? I'm going to let you go first and then I'll uh, I'll probably be a little bit more lengthy. OK, well, I think it was like in 1993, I raced in a me- media slash celebrity race at Shano Speedway. And I raced in a in a hobby stock car, and uh, I actually got to race against Brian Noble, former Green Bay Packers linebacker. And uh, but anyway, did you did you punt him? No, he he was he would have won the race, but his car broke. <laughs> but anyway, I mean, I knew I wasn't going nearly as fast as what the cars normally do, but I thought I was doing okay. You know, I went into the corners, the car was sliding and stuff. I watched the video afterwards. I I haven't watched it since because I'm embarrassed at how slow I was going. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, uh, you had fun though. That's the main yeah. thing. So, <laughs> so one thing that I'll, I'll say this: so Dirt Race Central, any of the streaming platforms, get them. They're they're great. But if you're serious about racing, especially if you're you know if you're just getting started, you need to make sure that you have somebody videotape you every race because if you're not running in the front they might not catch you they might not they might only get a lap or two of you during the whole race depending where you're at in the field so have somebody tape and so my right hand man chonga man we used to argue right i'd come in and he'd be like you're tight in the middle of the corner i'm like you're an idiot car's turning just fine you know what the hell you're talking about he's like i'm telling you right now the car's tight in the middle of the corner i'm like you're full of shit like I'm driving a car. Don't tell me the car's tight in the middle of the corner. I'm driving it. He goes, I'm watching the car it's tight in the middle of the corner. Argued with him, right? Well, all of a sudden I had somebody videotaping me. I watch it. I'm like, I think I'm a little tight in the middle of the corner. He's like, Yeah, no shit. Been telling you that for two years. I'm like, Well, I, I it didn't feel tight. He goes, You need to watch it. So next thing you know, we start watching the car right in the center of the corner. You have that little twitch. All of a sudden you're like. Wow, you can make a little adjustment. I helped Dave Delsiak down at Sycamore. And, and the whole first year I was helping him, I'm like, I'm going to kill this guy. Like, literally. Like, he's literally running in the wrong groove on the racetrack. I'm like, I'm literally going to lose my shit. I keep getting phone calls. I had it on Do Not Disturb. Hold on. Hold on. That, that'd be my mom right there. Mom, I love you. I love you. I will call you after the show, mom. I love you. I will call you back. So um, I should have, I should always text my mom. Hey, doing the show. That's what I got to do. So, but I, I, I remember yelling at him all year long. I'm like, Dave, you are not racing on the track in the right spot. He's like, he goes, well, I want to make my car work there. I'm like, don't care. <laughs> You're not in the right spot. Well, next thing you know, we're watching tape together, and I'm like, look, you can visibly see how much faster this part of the track is if you're hitting your marks, right? And guess what? Last year, he won 11 features. He kind of made him look stupid last year because the car worked good, and next thing you know, he found a couple little things by watching film. He's thinking one thing, and he's not the only one because I did the same thing. But I'm telling you what, that is a very, very good question from Brent getting that film and then having that perspective, looking at it from the outside versus being in the car. It's a whole different universe. I can tell you that much. And it is a huge tool. If you want to win races, next question. All right. Um, During the turbo interview, Bubba, the love sponge mentioned track surfacants. Surfactants. Uh, Surfactants. Okay. Thank you. (laughs) Could you go into more detail about track surfactants uh, when they're applied before big races, certain times of year, weather related, et cetera, et cetera, how they're applied, the different types that various tracks may use and whether sanctioning bodies require tracks to use it? 
Yeah, so so sanctioning bodies do not require any any of that. But essentially what that is, that's something you're mixing with the water to try to get a little different reaction. And, and tracks have tried all kinds of stuff, right? I mean, down in the South, corn syrup or Coke syrup was a big deal. Um, dish soap, laundry soap. Um, there's been a ton of different things that track prep crews have mixed in with the water and and really as a their whole the whole goal is to try to keep the dust down, right? And and one thing that I learned is is rainwater is far better than tap water. Just for whatever reason, the the reaction it has with the dirt. So Coach Cross, this is a good one for you, because your dad did the track prep for a long time over at the Viking Speedway. Was there anything that they ever mixed with their water at Viking to try to keep moisture in the track, keep the dust down, do anything like that? No, not really. It was basically, um, they had some stuff going on with well water and city water. I know there was a little bit different issue with the way that stuff reacted with the dirt and and with the clay. And um, they always tried testing and, you know, make sure you're, you know, what kind of soil do you have so you know. Um, but for the most part, no, we never really got into the sawdust or the, um, I know what's his face out in Bismarck had that H2O soil stuff. I don't know if you ever saw that. Um, I know Schaefer's has a product that you can use too. Um, but we never really got into that stuff. It was just mainly, um, you know, figuring out, like I said, it was, we had a well and then we had city water too. So that was a big difference. Softness and hardness of water, um, I mean, changes the way, um, the dirt reacts and how wet it is and how you hold the moisture. Um, I know people are pumping out of lakes, out of sloughs, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So the big thing is you got to try to find what works best for you. Um, and then, like you said, watering off the track and where the dust is, cause that's what deters people ways is go to the racetrack. Oh, there's dust flying everywhere. So, um, you know, never really got into additive additives or uh, stuff like that. I think what we need to do is we need to get all the Wasota tracks, right? to go ahead and call Daytona one performance lubricants, get aqua and go ahead and just mix that and just start putting the track, the, the, uh, the, the prep, the tire prep, just go ahead and mix that right with the water. And that way nobody ever, either everybody's going to fail a tire test or nobody's going to fail a tire test. And that's kind of where they were going a little bit in that conversation on with Bubba and turbo is, you know, this, this tire testing and this track surfactants having an, is that kind of coming back? Well, they would have all tested bad, right? If there would have been, if if not just three of them would have tested bad, they would have all had the same stuff. But there's a lot of different stuff tracks have tried, and they'll continue to try because it's always a, it's a challenge keeping the dust down, keeping moisture in the track, and and some of these people are pretty darn creative chemists trying to figure out um, how to how to get the soil to react better. So good questions there by Brent. Thanks for the feedback. Thanks for the questions. Um, you got another one there. What, what's the other one you got? Um, yes. Uh, this one's from Casey. Um, Wasota was doing some small sponsors or try to raise money. And rumor was some of it is going towards track championships, which is a great idea to make championships special again. But have you guys heard anything about this? It would be nice to know to decide if a person should run for track championship or tour or tour racing. So, coach, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna ask you if you've heard anything. But what he's talking about here, you know, in case you missed it a few months back, is right after the annual meetings, um, was sort of put a little committee together. I know it was spearheaded by a, a couple of promoters and. Um, Mike Jordette was kind of the main guy, um, one of the Wasota board members, behind a kind of a we are Wasota, a Wasota loyalty deal where fans and sponsors, businesses could could donate five hundred dollars, and I don't know what they were going to get in return, but basically a fundraiser for Wasota, and it, it kind of gained a little traction there for a couple weeks, and they had a long list of things they were going to do with it. One of the things was put money towards maybe the track point funds or whatnot. I personally, I haven't heard a thing about it in weeks, maybe a couple months. Krause, have you heard anything about it? No, I haven't. I haven't heard anything either. I know they, I know um, that was the big issue. Was, hey, where's this money going? We want to make sure we know where this is going. Um, the last email email I had seen had said that yes, we're gonna we're gonna be transparent with this. We're gonna let everybody know. Hey, 
here's where this is going. This is a national point fund, track point fund. Like I said, they even talked about helping tracks. Um, so I'm sure that's in the works now. I'm sure this thing with Denny didn't help because I know he was helping with that too. So um, like I said, I, I, they're going to hold up their end of the deal and let everybody know. Um, like you said, now it's going to be sooner or later. All of a sudden, you know, Super Stocks is 400 to win um, your track. What if it's 800 now or 600 or 700 or 1,000? You know you know what I mean? Um, this is a big deal, and especially help out, you know, keeping these guys local. So uh, hopefully they come out with something here sooner than later. Yeah, with the Wasota season kind of slated to start here in the next couple of weeks, this is something that's probably pretty important to kind of get out there. So, you know, Wasota board members, whichever one of you that are listening to the show, right, go ahead and and – see if you can maybe start posting some stuff online about what's going on here. And, and Casey, what I would probably do is, is I would email all the board members, go to wasota.org. Their emails are all on there. Just shoot over the mass email, maybe call Callie um, at the office and, and just ask her. She'd probably be able to fill you in better than we can as far as what's going on with that. But it looked like it was gaining some traction, but boy, if they can enhance the track point funds, um, that might keep a few drivers home instead of traveling, especially with travel costs these days. Um, I have another question here. This one came from Rick um, in regards to the sprint cars, right? There's a guy that uh, missed the kind of the opening couple races there for the high limit series. What is going on with J-Mac, James McFadden? So have you guys heard anything there? I, I dug a little bit. And it sounds like now they it's, they're still a couple weeks out from the next uh, high limits race, and from everything that I saw on the sprint car sites that I went to online, is he is planning to be here in the states. Um, he had issues with his visa. I don't know what the process is. I don't know why it took so long or why they didn't get it done. You know, in time to get him over here in time to start the season. But everything that I've seen online is showing that J-Mac is intending to be here. Dominic Selzy has been filling in for him in the Roth Motorsports 83, but it sounds like he's going to be here uh, when High Limits is back underway. Um, and then Randy had one, so I posted a pic some pictures here. Bert, I even tagged you, but you're kind of a fun killer. I think I tagged Krauss, too, and you guys don't play along, so you kind of suck. Just going to go ahead and point that out on Facebook. The, the, the how, 10, how, how, how 10 my, photos. How am I, uh, how am I, I bad? I, I didn't see you, post, I didn't see you posting your 10. You didn't, and, and if you did, you weren't oh, taking me. That. Yeah, you're, okay. You're supposed, you're I will, supposed okay. To, I will do that. Oh, well, what the heck? <laughs> so I posted a, my 10th one though was, was, uh, some pictures from the old Apple Grand Prix. Cross, you probably, maybe you did too, Bert. So the Apple Grand Prix go-kart track in Somerset, Wisconsin, when we used to go down to the Cedar Lake Speedway, it was kind of a thing. And this is what Randy said. When we went to USA Nationals with Soda 100, we would always go to the Apple Grand Prix as, as a family. Whoever was with us, we'd go go-kart racing, and then we'd go over to the races. I did that for years. That was, that was like a thing. And his question was this. So – you think about all the tracks that you've been to, right? Maybe maybe on a yearly basis or multiple times a year. Are there are there tracks that like when I went to track A, we always went here when we went to that racetrack, right? So for example, Cedar Lake Speedway, when we went to Cedar Lake Speedway, we went to the Apple Grand Prix go-kart track. Bob lost his life here a couple of years ago. I think he had a long battle with cancer. Got to know him pretty well, but that was that was part of it. Was there anything that tied in like that with you guys? Like, if you went to a certain track, it was tradition. Like, I'm going racing here. We're also going here. Do uh, or, bars? Do bars? One hundred percent. Absolutely, they do. <laughs> absolutely, I know. Well, Hibbing Raceway for years, right? People get done racing at the Hibbing Raceway, and then bam, everybody go over to Mister Nick's Quarter Bar, and there'd be. 10 race car haulers outside Mr. Nick's. That was a thing. That was what they did every Saturday night after having a, a, a select few drivers. So, yes, if they're, if that's the case. Well, I, I got a couple. Um, well, when I was on MJ's crew and we would race at the Punky Manor, 
Um, we would always stay at the Best Western. Uh, it's no longer there. They tore it down. Uh, but what was cool about the Best Western was there was a bar in the hotel. So you didn't have to leave the hotel to go to a bar. And so, I mean, it, you know, after the races, you know, we'd go down into the bar. Drivers from other crews would come down there. Even if they weren't staying at that hotel, they would come come just to go to the bar. It was kind of a hangout for drivers and pit crew members. So that was a lot of fun. And then the other example is uh, when I was on MJ's crew and we raced the Wissota 100, um, if we would qualify for the feature on Thursday night, that meant that we didn't have to race Friday night. So then Friday afternoon, we would go bowling at the bowling alley in downtown New Richmond. It's not a bowling alley anymore, uh, but we would go bowling there. And so that was always, that was always fun. I mean, we had a lot of fun bowling. I mean, you, I, I'm sure you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I wish there was videos and pictures of some of that. <laughs> Kraus, how about you? <laughs> oh, we <clears throat> the only story I got is every time I, and you actually ran there too. Do you remember when we ran up in Ada, Norman County Raceway? Um, you were chasing points, and um, I started running up there a little bit when I first started traveling. Um, <clears throat> anyway, there's nowhere ever to eat coming home from there, so we used to always call Pam's Cafe in Rothsay. Uh, you know, the big truck stop there in Rossi. Yep. So we'd call ahead, get some burgers done, and we'd pull in half the time. We had to fill up with gas anyway. You know, those old Suburbans uh, sucked the gas. You had to stop halfway by the time you got home. Um, and then we'd, we'd stop there and grab some takeout, and then we'd head on out. But um, I think, uh, what's what was what's the bar? Is it Was it the Mars bar that was in um, Huron? Remember the bar in Huron that we used to always jet on over to during the one when the 100 was out there? That I mean, you used to have – People, you'd, you'd, you'd actually race to get to the Mars bar because if you didn't, you didn't have a place to sit. So we used to always, and I never got out there, but we did the one time we would we'd sprint over there um, to get there. But uh, that that's, it's just, it's tradition. It's cool stuff. Um, it's nice. Like you said, you go to Cedar Lake, you're going here, you're going traveling. Um, I do it all the time on my hockey trips. We stop at this, when we go down to Rochester, we stop at the same gas station every time when we come home we stop at the clearwater truck stop so we can get all our donuts and our bakery items in the morning so it's it's crazy what you do when you go to certain places but you usually always um find these these cool places and you're always stopping there yeah cedar lake it was it was always the apple grand Prix uh grand prix go-kart track but the big one for for 71a was proctor country kitchen right i mean most friday nights after superior we would stop there because you had to drive right past it on the way home. You go right past Proctor. But every Sunday night, guys, for literally 20 years, from like literally 1993 all the way till 2000, I guess 2013, I think the place finally closed down. That's why I quit racing because there was no more catch. <laughs> there was a big group of us every Sunday night, right? I mean, there was, I bet you 25, 30 of us every Sunday night and not everybody went every night. I went every night. My daughter went every night while she was with us. Um, Chad and Clint Larson, Lauren Inman, Changa, Crash Carlson. I mean, Flex. I mean, there was a ton of us that every Sunday night after Proctor, the races got done. We load up, bam, we go to the kitchen. Guys, it was so much of a tradition that we'd be like, Oh, race was special. Well, that wasn't on the menu, right? It was a country kitchen. They knew what it was. Like, race was special? Yep, that's what we want. We'd have the same thing. And, and man, we had some memories there. I remember uh, I won a feature in Proctor, and my pit guy, Changa, decided, I'm going to dump a, you know, kind of like a Gatorade bath, ice water, right? He'd, he'd douse me with ice water inside the car. Well, on the track championship one night, and I figured, I'm, you know what? I'm getting these fuckers back, plain and simple. They're getting it, right? You know them silver spray bottles for cooling off your radiator? I had that thing charged and ready to go. And literally, when I got to the country kitchen, I walked in, and that thing was empty. I doused everybody inside the country kitchen. It was all our people. And, and the waitresses laughed. They're like, you guys are all dumbasses, right? Like, they didn't care. <laughs> that, that was how much of a tradition it was. I mean, I there was times, guys, at the end when I wasn't racing for points. It's like, ah, do I want to go race Proctor on Sunday night? You know, and, and then Whitney would be like, uh, Dad, we got to go to the kitchen. 
all right, let's go to Proctor, right? It was it was that much of a tradition that we went racing, and there was times it's like, I didn't really care about the racing. We just wanted to go to Kitch afterwards. So punch the buttons below, fans. I want to know, was there traditions that you guys had that you guys still have? Because that's kind of the, the fun, the stories that we like to hear. That's what keeps racing going is those kind of things. Let's jump on to the next segment here. 2024 Weekly Pickums brought to you by our friend that does our editing, Coach Cross. Who do we got? Yes, elevate-visual.com video productions. Uh, make sure if you need any drone work done, any uh, video work, any video production done. Um, if you're a realtor and you need um, drone to fly over your land, fly over your house, whatever you're selling, uh, make sure you get a hold of Brandon at elevate-visual.com. You can also find him on Facebook. Uh, thanks a lot, Brandon, for all you do. And uh, so weekly winners last week, uh, Mike. Boy, he needed this one, guys, because he's down in the cellar in our points. Plus four. Mike, the big winner on the week. And Curtis, Bert, and New Dan, Man Bun Dan, whatever we want to call him here, plus two. The rest of us, Yahoo, is zero. So our picks, and we're going to kind of start. I, I had somebody say, you know what? I listen to the show. We, you're talking about the picks, but we don't have, know who anybody picked. So we're not going to name off all 10 of our picks, but we'll name who we picked, right? Because I have fans going, well, who the hell do you guys pick? You talk about these picks? Tell us who you picked. So I'm like, all right, well, that makes sense for the people that are listening. So last week, um, so at, at Kennedale for the World of Outlaws Prince, us three, I picked Brent Marks. Bert, you picked Carson Macedo. Carlos, you picked David Gravel. Bert, Macedo won. You got two points there. I got fifth. Kraus had a, a close second, so kind of a little battle there. At Atomic, I had Pierce. Bert had RTJ, and Kraus had T-Mac. I did the best of us three, but uh, none of us got any points on the late models. At Brownstown, I had Pierce there as well. And uh, Bert, you had T-Mac, and Kraus, you had RTJ. So that's who we had last week. Our standings right now. Our defending champ, Curtis, is still leading away at 65. Brad at 59. Chonga's at 56. The old 71A here is at 51. 29 star. You're at, I think, 48 is what I have you down at. Bert at 45. Kent at 44. Good Jeff at 38. New Dan at 35. And Mike at 25. I don't know if them are current. I feel like them are last week's points. I don't know if he sent me the current ones, but we'll have to check and see. So this week's events, this week's, we're going to pick a few races here this week. Before we get into that, I want to give a shout out to one of our sponsors, Daytona One Performance Lubricant. So they, they do anything lubricant related. In fact, they do stuff for NASA. So Buck, the founder of Daytona One Performance Lubricants, guys, he's actually in the NASA. Yes, NASA as in space right he's in their hall of fame for lubricants so the guy knows lubricants he knows what he's talking about they have a lot of different products we've talked about several but one of one of their products guys that they have here is gear oil right so they got 7590 and they have 3060 so they got a couple different blends and they call it the fastest gear lube in the world and, and they specialize. This is all new technology, right? Gear oil has been around for a long time, but they specialize in really trying to figure out ways to have less drag, less, less friction, less heat, which is going to make your stuff last longer and more power to the rear wheels because of less friction. It's worth getting a jug of this, right? How do you get a hold of, how do you get a hold of the products they have? Give Chad a call, 507-828-3536. He's the area rep. They have a Facebook page. They have a website. That's Daytona One Performance Lubricants. A lot of great products out there. A lot more than just the stuff we talked about. It's worth checking them out online. So, World of All Lost Sprint Cars here this weekend, guys. Of course, that's always on Dirt Vision. Friday night, they're at the Thunderbird Speedway in Muskogee, Oklahoma. Saturday night, they're at the 81 Speedway in Park City, Kansas. Guys, I know you know who you picked. Let's just quickly say who we picked. Myself, I got David Gravel both nights for the World of Outlaws. Bert, 
Who do you have this week for World of Outlaws? Macedo on Friday night and Gravel on Saturday night. David Sand and Gravel. That's who you got on Saturday. Macedo on Friday. Coach Kraus, who do you have for the World of Outlaws? I don't even know who I picked. You're going to make me go back and look? You don't know who you picked? Come on there, guy. What are you, what are you doing? I you don't go know. Ahead. What's, you what's go this ahead guy's name? There. I know who I – World of Outlaw Sprint Cars. I took David Gravel both nights. That's what I – all right. So, so Bert, Bert's going to maybe slide a fast one in there. So, there's 10 of us picking in the group. Also, we got uh, Real Grand Waste Services – as Jeff would call it, the nipples 50. It's the nippy 50, <laughs> right? At Makokata, um, that's in, in Iowa. That's on Flow Racing. That's Friday and Saturday. And they're get, we're actually going to pick against better judgment, right? Because none of us really know much about the IMCA guys. But we're going to – we don't normally pick this, but this is for Brad. This is for Brad. We're going to pick the IMCA Modifieds on Friday and Saturday – and we're going to pick the late models, super late models there on Friday and Saturday as well. Bert, IMCA Modifieds, who do you have? Well, first I got to say, I can't believe all the whining that some of these people are <clears throat> are doing. They want to pick everything, but then when, they, when it's a race when they don't know something, then they start whining. But uh, I digress. Um, I am taking Jeff Bone Larson both nights. Coach Krause? <laughs> Come on, Bert. <laughs> We're IMC. What what are we picking now? <laughs> IMCA mods. I don't even know what an IMCA mod is. Where do they race? Do they where do they exist somewhere? I don't know. All no, over kidding. the entire country. Uh, we got to give them a hard time. Well, yeah, it, I was. You were just starting stuff the other night with Dan because I I was going to chime in. I just know how you are. I'm um, trying to. Ah, well, IMCA is well, so it gets three states. Well, that's all we are. IMCA is the rest of the country. You and your nonsense over there. Um, I'm taking uh, Dylan Thornton both nights. All right, all right. So I got uh, on Friday night. I got Jeff Bone Larson, and on Saturday night I got Travis Denning. Um, so I got I, I split it up. I don't normally do that, but I did that this time for the late model portion of it. Bert, who do you have late models? I have Pierce both nights. Coach? Bobby Pierce, both nights. Shit, all three of us do. Good grief. How am I, <laughs> I going to gain any ground? Well, good thing I'm ahead. Of, you guys ain't catching me in the late models. I'm ahead of both of you guys, so that's good. You ain't catching me there because all three of us have the smooth operator. Spring Nationals. This is Ray Cook series, uh, late model action. And, of course, the Nippy 50, that's on flow both nights. Spring Nationals, late models, that's on flow both nights as well. Friday night, I-75 Speedway, Sweetwater, Tennessee. Saturday night, Haswell. That is a badass bull ring. High, high banks, super fast racetrack, Taswell, Tennessee. Friday and Saturday, Bert, what say you? I have Dale McDowell both nights. Coach? Bert, what? come on now. <laughs> of course, I got... Um... Both nights, Dale McDowell. Well, I do not have him both nights. <laughs> I do have him on night one, though. I got Dale McDowell. We got the old Mac Daddy. All three of him. All, all three of us have Dale McDowell on Friday. But I'm going to go with Mike Marlar Saturday night at Taswell. I'm taking a chance here, guys. I know that McDowell is going to be at both. And I looked at Marlar's schedule. It's not on there. But my God, he lives in Tennessee. I, I mean, I would have to think 21,000 a win. I would think he's going to be at Taswell we'll find out that's who I have on Saturday night so that leads us to this our final segment three bold predictions brought to you by our friends at dirt track supply out in Watertown South Dakota Ron and Trevor Anderson um highly successful on the track and off the track um they got a great business over there they build the aero chassis service a lot of a lot of different racetracks over there you need fab work done. You need parts. You need anything racing related. That is your go-to. That's Dirt Track Supply in Watertown, South Dakota. So let's start with our accountability session here first. We had a few things come off the board. So, Bert, you had a couple of them come off the board. One this week and one we're going to go back a little bit. 
you said that T Mac was going to win one this weekend. That did not happen. Episode 204, this is back November 22nd. You said at least three Lucas Oil late model guys were going to make the switch to the World of Outlaw late model series. Kind of a knee jerk to the whole uh, points deal there. <laughs> and uh, that did not happen as well. Coach Krause, you had three come off the board. One's an old one, two are fresh. You said that Hot Sauce, Giovanni Selzy, was going to drop to third in points. He didn't have the best weekend, but he's still tied for the lead. That did not happen. You said T Mac. You said T Mac was going to win his first race in Rocket One. And I said, I said, are we talking heat racer feature? And you're like, oh no, oh no, we're talking feature. <laughs> we ain't talking heat race. We're talking, well, guess what there, Jacko? He won his heat race. You should have went with old 71 A's advice, right? I've been trying to coach you. You're uncoachable. I've been, I'm trying, I'm laying down a bun for you, trying to help you out, but no, not taking it. And you stay, I'm going to stick with feature. Well, that cost you because he did not win a feature. Did win a heat. Could have had a point. Didn't want it. Episode 204, 1122. You said RTJ is going to follow the world of old laws in 2024. And that's not going to happen there. I pushed mine. I'm not going to do that this week. I pushed mine all out. I've been putting a lot of stuff out kind of into the future here. So I don't have anything off the board. But all three of mine for this week will come off the board this weekend. Good Jeff. He has a couple here. He said... Donnie Schatz was going to win at least one here this weekend. That did not happen. But the only one of us to get one right was good Jeff. He said RTJ wouldn't even sniff a podium this past weekend in Lucas Oil action. Boy, he was spot on. He did not get on the podium. So he got one there. And uh, the peanut gallery here, Huddy would have a better average than T-Mac. That one here from Curtis. Huddy would have a better. That did not happen. He would have. He would have. That's a that's a tough beat. He had a flat. Um, Huddy would have, should have, could have, didn't. So he did not. So our current standings right now, gentlemen, uh, we keep track of how many we have correct. That's a category. And our correct percentage. As far as the amount correct, Bert is leading the way. Um, apparently none of us are getting nothing right lately because that ain't changed. He's at eight. Three of us at six. Uh, Coach, myself, and Good Jeff are at six. The Peanut Gallery at three. So Bert still leading the way as far as correct picks. I'm leading the way as far as correct percentage goes, 28.6 and narrow margin over everybody else. So we're going to make three laps around the track. We have uh, a couple fans here sent us some picks here this week on predictions. We got good Jeff, Bert, Krause. So, Bert, you're going to go first. We'll go to Coach Krause, and then I'll read off the others. So, Bert, your first prediction. Well, I'll just go, uh, I mean, through my picks, uh, McDowell will double up at the Spring Nationals and win two features. All right. Mac Daddy going to double up. Boy, that's, I, it'd be interesting to look back. When the last time he won on back-to-back -back night was, I bet that's been a while. I mean, he, he's it's his home it's his home turf. He's gonna be tough, but two in a row for Mac Daddy. All right, Coach Krause. Um, we're gonna do a little something a little different here. I'm gonna say one of the races this weekend down at that uh, Southern Nat deal, either I-75 or Taswell, it will rubber up. One of those features. Is going to rubber up. So I'm going to throw a little curveball into things, give something little people think about. But uh, just a prediction, I think there's going to one of those nights is going to rubber. All right. Now I want to, I just want a little clarification here. So rubber by meaning when it, when it rubbers, it latches down and they are flat out in one lane train around the racetrack in the rubber. Is that, I'm assuming that's what you mean. That's right? correct. And you and me will make that decision since we're the professional rubber racers. <laughs> um, we've all, we've all been in it. We, we, me and you have, I've won races in it. You've won races in it. Um, it's just, it's just the way it is. So we're usually pretty good at, uh, those, those rest of those yahoos in our pick them. They got no idea what that is. They argue about it, but 
Uh, <laughs> you and myself know what's going on. Sounds good. That'll be a judgment call. All right. Ken sent us one here, or he sent us a couple. He said, Huddy and T Mac are both going to miss out on being in the final four for the Lucas Oil Dirt Late Model Series in 2024. T Mac's a little bit back right now, but Huddy's still in that final four spot. But both of them are not going to be in the final four at the end of the year. So we got one here from Good Jeff. The Hoker sponsored Red 32 will not be on the podium either night at this week's Nipples 50 event at Makokita. So Bobby Pierce not going <laughs> to be on the podium either night at the Nippy 50. <laughs> <laughs> the nipples 50 he calls it all right so kenny sent us one here he says the uh, hot sauce giovanni selzy gonna win at thunder hill friday night in the world of outlaw sprint cars and i'm gonna go i'm gonna go with a little parlay here guys and it's gonna be this weekend so it's gonna come off the board between david gravel bobby pierce and mike marlar they will each win at least one A main this weekend. Gravel, Pierce, Marlar all get at least one feature win this weekend. All right, Bert. Lap number two. All right. I'm going to go IMC mods and say Jeff Bone Larson will um have a podium finish both nights. And then I'll just throw in that uh, Dylan Thornton will be on the podium at least one of those nights. All right. So both nights podium for Bone Larson, Dylan Thornton, at least one podium. Yeah. That, that last part's just for coach Krause. All right. little parlay <laughs> action there. All right. Coach Krause, lap number two. Hey, I suckered that into him. That wasn't why I was shaking my head, Bert. It was, was because you said IMCA on our show. It's like he must not read my text. Remember when I say like these guys are banned? Like that's like <laughs> IMCA. That's I so, hey, I, I got him though, Ryan. He he made that he made it make it bold. So I'm gonna go um by the end of the weekend, World Outlaw Sprint Cars, you're gonna have a new point leader, and the point leader is gonna be Donnie Shots. Donnie Shots taking the point lead. All right. All right, Kent has another pick, another prediction here. David Gravel is going to be the bridesmaid for the World of Outlaw points season in 2024. David Gravel will finish second in World of Outlaw sprint car action. Good Jeff has another one. He's got a Gravel prediction as well. David Gravel, no podiums this weekend, and is going to drop to third in the points at the end of this weekend's action. Kenny has another one here as well. He's got a little, uh, I guess I'll call it a parlay kind of, right? So between Donnie Schatz, David Gravel, and Logan Schuhart at the 81 Speedway, two of those drivers, at least two of those drivers, will be on the podium. Schatz, Gravel, Schuhart, at least two of the three will be on the podium Saturday night at the 81 Speedway. My second prediction going to be a little parlay here as well. A little bit of nipples 50 action here. between. Okay, so Bobby Pierce and Chad Simpson will have a better average finish over the weekend than RTJ and Brandon Shepard. Pierce, Chad Simpson, better average finish than RTJ and Brandon Shepard. All right, Bert, your final lap. Third and final All right, I, prediction. I just had to look this up to make sure I could do this one. Um, Carson Macedo will be the first World of Outlaw Sprint Car driver to win two features this year. It's been different feature winner every night? Yes. No kid. Okay. All right. So Carson Macedo, the first to get a pair. That does not go with your – oh, no, yeah, I guess you did pick Macedo one night, didn't you? All right. Yeah. All right. All right. So Macedo's going to be the first to have two World of Outlaw wins. All right. All right, Coach Krause, third lap. 
Yeah, we're gonna go uh, with Dale McDowell. I've been I've been baiting Bert here to get a little bit bolder, and he's going bolder <laughs> than me. But I had this one, so I'm taking it. Uh, McDowell's gonna have a win and a podium this weekend. I know Bert, you went a little bit bolder, but you're like the super bold now because we've been ripping <laughs> on you. Um, that's the reason why you don't have 20 right now, and we're at so we're still at six. So, um, but it's all in good fun. So I'm going McDowell with a win and a podium this weekend. Okay. Okay. All right. So good Jeff's third and final prediction here. Kent only had two. So good Jeff's third and final prediction. Chris Simpson is going to have one win and two total podiums between the modified and the late model this weekend at the nipples 50. Chris Simpson with one win and two total podiums between the mod and the late. Looks like he's in a new double duty. All right. Kenny's third and final prediction here. This one's bold, Kraus. This one's bold. The Lucas Oil Final Four drivers. None of those will be drivers that were in the Final Four in 2023. <laughs> That's bold. Could happen. Could happen. That there's a couple. I mean, you can get Dalton Wilson in there. You could maybe T Max slide up in. Maybe Marlar's a guy that could get in there. Um, I don't know. I mean, you got JD and RTJ looking kind of good. Them two are pretty solid. Moran. Uh, that's pretty bold. That's pretty bold. All right, my third and final prediction here as well. IMCA modified action at the nipples fifty. Bone Larson and Travis Denning are going to both podium both nights and will account for both feature wins. So Bone Larson and Travis Denning are both going to podium both nights and both feature wins will be one of those two drivers. There now, you have a, little, a little tidbit about uh, Jeff Bone Larson. Uh, he won a five thousand dollar to win race modified I'm say modified race at Shano Speedway several years ago. Okay. And he ran good. I think he won the points down there at that uh Northwest Florida series they did between uh whatever Northwest Northwest Florida Speedway and uh, Southern Raceway. I think he won the points down there in that deal. So um he's he's got a pretty good hot rod. He's track champion over there. Um, at Makokata, so he's going to be tough to beat. Travis Denning, uh, Travis Denning won the track championship, I believe, at East Moline, which is kind of right in that neck of the woods. So there it is, episode in the books. So thanks to all of our sponsors and fans, as always. If you have predictions, if you got feedback, you got questions, go ahead, reach out to us. If you got hate mail, it's Bert Lehman, B E R T L E H M A N. That's where the hate mail goes. Okay, the rest of us, we want the positive stuff to us. But I uh, hope you enjoyed the show, and uh, thanks for tuning in. As always, I'm Ryan. That is Bert. That is Coach Krause. Thanks for tuning in to the One to Go Show.